Um, she is the CEO of the American Cancer Society and the advocacy affiliate, the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. She was appointed to this position in 2021, and in this prestigious uh, organization's 107-year-old history, she is the first woman to hold this position. Um, so Karen initially did her training um, and her PhD in molecular biology at the University of California at San Diego. She also has an MBA from the Fox School of Business and Management at Temple University. She continued her training under Dr. Webster Cavani at the Ludwig Institute of Re Cancer Research, again at San Diego. Her first faculty position was in the year 2000 at the Cincinnati College of Medicine, after which she uh, continued on to Thomas Jefferson University, where she established their prostate cancer group, which became um, a really significant point in her career as she worked in the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center at the Jefferson Health um, she progressed even further, became the director of the SKCC, um, became the executive vice president of their oncology services, and has since um, really, you know, indulged in her passion for patient advocacy and improving patient outcomes, um, and has transitioned into the realm of CEO of the American Cancer Society, where she advocates to improve patient lives and to also increase diversity and provide researchers the tools we need to tackle challenging clinical questions. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce Karen. Oh, one last thing. Uh, CU likes to recognize our invited speakers with the Cancer Warrior Award for their outstanding contributions and achievements in cancer research, and in particularly in continuing to train and mentor future cancer warriors. So Karen. Thank you so much, Claire. Thank you so much for the invitation, everyone here. It's great to be back in Colorado. I was here around the time this campus was being born, uh, when there were still some uh, shovels and it goes in uh, Dr. DeGregory's car with them. A lot of dog hair we were talking about today, right? But it was a really good trip and um, and just incredible um, growth that's happened since the last time I was on this campus about 10 years ago. Um, I don't think anybody's ever called me a cancer warrior before, but I absolutely love that. I'm really glad to, to take on that moniker. So thank you, Claire. And uh, we'll display that really, really proudly with my team. So I um, have made the journey from being a, uh, you know, a, a, a prostate cancer researcher my entirety of my career. I always consider myself a scientist and be a scientist to a cancer center director, head of oncology services for a 16 hospital to two state system to coming to the American Cancer Society, which you may know and not know at the same time. So ACS is 110 years old and I have both lied to you and told you a truth all in the same sentence. So up until just a few years ago, ACS was actually a federated model, was multiple ACSs with multiple CEOs across the country. What was happening here in Denver was very different than what was happening in my home city of Philadelphia. And so what I was asked to do is to take this on to have one organization, one ACS committed toward a unified cancer mission and execute that across the country. And I'm so proud of the team that I work with and what we've done. So I wanna to take today to orient you to the kinds of things we're thinking about, the kinds of things we are already working on together, which you may or may not know about. And I really look forward to discussion about how we can work together to end cancer as we know it for everyone. So let me see if I can get my slides moving here. Okay, um, just a few disclosures which have no bearing on anything today. So I always like to, to begin, like, why, why do we exist? So the American Cancer Society exists for something I know we all agree on, which is the burden of cancer is unacceptably high. And our unique value proposition at the organization is to work toward our goal, something we do every day, all 3,000 employees at the American Cancer Society do every day, and that's to improve the lives of cancer patients and their families. And the way that we do that is through integrating research, advocacy, and patient support. And what success looks like is something that we also think about every day. There we go. Oh, think that's lovely. Thank you. Um, is, is, uh oh, now I don't know if I can. Now I can't advance my slides. 
I did? Ah, okay. It was just a little bit delayed. Sorry. Thank you for letting me know. What success looks like for us is ending cancer as we know it for everyone. I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but this is what I call the eight words that define us. We're not all words are created equal. And so what is the problem that we are trying to solve? This is in a, in a word or in a, in a schematic. The problem that we're trying to solve is something that we give to the nation every year. So this silhouette slide that, that everyone probably has seen or utilized in their own work is something that my team does in my intramural program of scientists based in Atlanta produce every year. It's our largest study that we do every year, which looks at cancer incidence and cancer mortality across the country and trends demographic and geographic. So the problem that we're facing right now in 2023 is an anticipated 1.9 million new diagnoses of cancer and more than 600,000 individuals who are unfortunately lose their life to one of the 200 diseases that we call cancer. So all of this is released every year. We're actually released in two parts of the year. The second uh, part of this year's release is actually coming out today. So it's an auspicious day for us in cancer facts and figures. And this is used um, both in the lay public area, as well as in that major article from Amadine Jamal, our head of, uh, of epidemiology at uh, ACS. And this uh, this paper, this cancer statistics is not just the most frequently cited manuscript in, si in all of oncology, but it's actually the most frequently cited manuscript in all of science every year. Um, and so it really is the single book of truth that everyone uses to understand what is the cancer problem. And I know I look to it regularly. So I talked about the fact that our unique value proposition to address the issue of cancer is, in is that integration of science advocacy and patient support, all with an eye toward what that goal is, improving lives. And that's how we determine our priorities at ACS. So I wanna give you some examples of what that really looks like. So let's start with discovery. This is something we feel really passionately about and the importance of research is really illustrated by this slide, which we also update these data every year. So what are you looking at? For men on the left, women on the right, what you're looking at is a trajectory of cancer mortality starting circa 1975, which was the around the era that the National Cancer Act was uh, was uh, was approved here in the United States by President Nixon, who actually did some good things, right? And that was one of them, creating the National Cancer Institute and the Cancer Center System. So. Had we done nothing, the natural rise of that curve is what looks what you would see in red. But circa 1991, there was an inflection point, and that was no accident. That 1991 inflection point was when the U.S. government, as well as the American Cancer Society, doubled down on efforts to fund cancer research. And we know that do we can directly ascribe that advances and breakthroughs and everything from cancer prevention to early detection to cure has led to this flattening of the curve. And we've seen that flattening pre-COVID. We'll see what COVID looks like, but pre-COVID, start to increase from a 0.5% year over year decline in mortality to 1% to last year when we finally hit 2% year over year decline in overall cancer mortality for both men and women. That delta looks like an overall 33% decline in cancer mortality, all cause cancer mortality since 1991 with almost 4 million deaths averted. And so our contribution to investment in science during that time has not been small. So if we just take that increment from 1991 to, to, to 2022, we've invested more than $3.3 billion in extramural funding for cancer research. We are the largest funder of cancer research outside the US government. And that equates to a little more than 13,000 individual grants being funded. So we very much believe that these data illustrate the importance of investment in cancer research. We share this with government officials as well as the lay public so that there is a real understanding about why it is that we are moving the curve in cancer and should not let up. This is just an example of where it is that we elect to have our extramural funding. Of course, this is all peer-reviewed funding. Um, and the pins on the left are just in the new funding in this last year. And the wheel on the right is just meant to show you that we um, we do can't cover all cancer types of funding and are not disease specific. On any given year, we have a little bit more than 40 or $433 million in cancer committed cancer research funding. We also, of course, run our, the journals, and those journals are a, me me a mechanism as well to report out, including for cancer facts and figures. 
And so since uh, 2003, beginning of, uh, or beginning of 2022, something really great happened for me, which is I hired our chief science officer, Bill Dayhut, out of the National Cancer Institute. Bill is a medical oncologist. He's a trialist. He has worked very well with scientists uh, of all walks of life, the, you know, clinicians, uh, obviously, but as well as basic science and population science. He also ran the cancer component of the clinical center at the NCI. So he knows a lot about what it is to translate into the clinic and also from the clinic back to the laboratory. Bill took a look at what we're funding portfolio looked like across the training continuum and immediately started to make changes. Here are some that were implemented just this year. For postdocs, we used to at the American Cancer Society have a, a restriction on people needing to be U.S. citizens. This didn't make a lot of sense to me, and it definitely didn't make sense to Bill Dayhut. So that's been eliminated. We've also increased stipend and eligibility for postdocs. For full professors, we haven't thought about you, we or haven't forgotten about you. We encourage. science studies of technologies that allow cancer care, this includes cancer detection and monitoring, to be in or close to home. It's unequivocal that this is actually where much uh, or where a significant amount of cancer care and early detection is going to come and also addresses something that you guys know a lot about here in Colorado, and that's disparities out in rural communities. So the HUD grants have been announced. We've just gone through our first round of peer review applications here to fund these. Um, and the whole concept is we know individuals are sitting on great ideas that allow uh, cancer care and detection to come closer to home. And we want you to have an opportunity to pilot those. We've also polled the cancer center directors. Of course, these are my, you know, former brothers and, and sisters. And uh, and meant, meant much of our cancer research funding goes out to the major NCI designated cancer centers. So understanding where the priorities lie of the cancer centers is really important. You know, you, you should have gotten the poll as well. I think you did and answered it, which are what are the things that are important to you that are funded? What's not being funded? What's keeping you up at night? And one of the things we keep hearing from the cancer center directors are spores. And so the SPORE program is also one that I heard from the NCI when I asked the NCI what's keeping them up at night. Great science. It's not being funded. So we are now in the beta test of an NCI SPORE ACS collaboration where SPORES that have just missed the funding line um, with the applicant's approval are given over to ACS for a rapid evaluation of the entire SPORE, but most importantly, from a feasibility standpoint for us, individual projects of the spores that are critical for it to get, get breath and have life uh, so that it has an opportunity for a successful resubmission. And we've just funded the first projects from some of these spores. And I've just given you some examples here. Um, both of those went to MD Anderson. So we haven't, uh, you know, we, we are committed to funding the best science, no question. And obviously we have calls that are specific areas where we feel like it's very important for us to have uh, funding. And so as you can see um, within Colorado, as I stand here at University of Colorado, you, you have the majority of funding from ACS. So overall in the state, there are 16 major research grants totaling a little more than $9 million and 15 of those are here at the University of Colorado. So uh, I didn't get a chance to give a call out to everybody who's here who is funded, but very interested in hearing from our uh, awardees about what you think is going well, where you think that we have opportunities to improve, and but very thankful for the exceptional science that was submitted and funded. So there are a number of, as well, of kind of notable uh, research studies that we're very excited about. You know, I'm just going to call out, you know, one here in developmental cell. They gave us a new understanding of mitochondrial derived um, vesicles and what they're actually doing uh, in the role of metophagy. And so we are really excited about this kind of science uh, and enthusiastic about funding more. We also know that there's incredible research that's being funded along the lines of P53, something that's always been a, a rich, um, rich body of work that happens here at University of Colorado and very enthusiastic about funding more of this type of research.
So how do we decide what it is that we fund? When we talked about cancer facts and figures and what it is that we report to the nation every year, we look at where their opportunities lie. Where are the gaps? Where can we really make a difference? But we also think about that from a state perspective, not just for cancer research funding, but also for other aspects of ACS. So uh, Dr. Ford and I were talking about this earlier today. We look pretty regularly state by state to see, and I'm sure you do too, or where are you disproportionately high? So if we look at cancer incidence rates in Colorado, or along some of the major disease types, one of the ones that really stands out is breast. And we know breast cancer research here is very strong. If we also look at breast cancer in the context of you know, death rates, we see slightly different profiles for prostate, which I know is a burgeoning area for many of you that I met with today. Uh, and of course, certainly Dr. Kramer has been a standout in that area. Uh, it's an important area for you to study as well in the state. And so we are thinking about where the problems are with cancer rates and both incidence and mortality in your state and addressing them in research and beyond. So overall, when it comes to breast cancer, let's just pick out that one since it's a disproportionate incidence here in Colorado. You know, what do we do right now overall for breast cancer at ACS? We have 161 grants totaling, totaling a little more than 123 million and three grants here in Colorado, a little more than a million in the breast cancer space that we're currently committed to. Um, you know, very excited by highlighting, you know, we, we think about every year, you know, what is it that we're going to highlight, but highlight advances, especially associated with triple negative breast cancer, where there is this disproportionate burden on women diagnosed with that breast cancer substep become very important to us and understanding aspects of disease progression that are associated, for example, with metastasis are really important. So again, thank you for submitting this high profile research. We also know that understanding new opportunities to, to, to look at pre, uh, breast cancer biology and also to follow breast cancer natural progression through things like cell-free DNA analysis is a really important aspect of study for us. So very thankful to these researchers as well for advancing the breast cancer science. So science is a really important component of what it is that we do. It's part of the history of the American Cancer Society. All of those entities in the federated model of ACS used to all pay into the same kitty for research, understanding that, that it was a really, really important component of what it is that we do. But it's the breakthroughs are not enough. Research is not enough. I think we would all agree with that. That doesn't mean that those breakthroughs get to people. And this is why there are the other two parts of ACS, advocacy and patient support. So I want to give you a vision into what that is and how that relates to the science. So again, we're a very data-driven organization. So what do the data tell us? The data tell us that these science breakthroughs and that 33% decline in mortality is not hitting everyone. And so if we just look at cancer mortality rates, men on the left, women on the right, all cancers on the top, breast on the right, and uh, on the bottom right and prostate on the bottom left. And we just compare black Americans or blacks in this country versus whites. You see that there is a sustained disparity and that's just black white disparity. There's also geographic disparity. There are other, other um, demographic disparities. And we have been part of the strategy to try to understand them much like your COE office is I'm sure of trying to, and your DEI office of trying to understand cancer disparities here in Colorado. We have funded a lot of that research and we're committed to not funding more research to explain why disparities exist. I'm gonna maybe be provocative and maybe you'll agree, but I think it's time for us to stop admiring the problem and start funding the science that actually addresses uh, or finding the issues that address what's on the right. We know the major drivers of cancer disparities. Some of it's what I call not sexy, lack of transportation, lack of housing, gaps in health and digital literacy, financial toxicity, lack of access to coverage, which is uniquely a, an American thing, and provider and health system unconscious bias. So these are the things that are the major drivers. There are more. There may be more that are true here in Colorado. But for our purposes, we're really interested in funding the strategies that overcome these, not continuing to admire. This gets back to the eight words that define us, where I said not words, all words were created equal. I said at the beginning, and this is not words on a page, this is actually how we derive priorities at the American Cancer Society, is that our goal, what success looks like for us as ending cancer as we know it, 
but it is a for everyone. These are the these are the the concepts where not all words are created equal, and that these two words are really sometimes discriminating whether we take path A or path B in terms of lifting up a new program or funding research. So what are we going to do about it? Part of what we do, and sometimes we change lives, millions of lives in one day, is advocacy. And this is where everyone can get involved. So Claire, when she was up here, talked about the fact that I'm the CEO of the American Cancer Society. That's true. I'm also the CEO of the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. What is that? That's a heck of a lot of words. So ACS CAN is a 501c4. What does that mean? It means we can and do lobby. It means that we do stand up and represent patients and can place pressure on elected officials to do the right thing as related to cancer. It's something you really have a hard time doing at a C3. I have to say it's one of the most fulfilling parts of my job because it's something I really couldn't do at a cancer center, but it's something I can do now. And what we ask is that patients, but also those associated with the cancer centers give us their stories. Because at the end of the day, when you're on Capitol Hill, which I was last week, with 700 different patients. We visited every Senate and House office for really does. And those patient stories are allow us, would allow us to create change. And I'm gonna talk about what some of that change is. So working at the federal level is incredibly important. It's gotta be data-driven. It's gotta be at the, with the patient at the, at the center of the lens. But also working at the state level is incredibly important. So I have advocacy operations in all 50 state capitals in Puerto Rico, as well as federal. What have we done? So here's an example. So one of the things that we noted is that about 50% of all new oncology approval, approvals in the last 10 years require or recommend a companion diagnostic or biomarker. Yet many of the state plans were not covering this for patients, so they had no access to it. So in the middle of 2022, we got to work in the state of Illinois as our advocacy teams. We look for where we can create legislative wins. We went to work at the legislature and had passed into law a requirement to cover biomarker testing for cancer patients. That model legislation allowed us actually to go to work and get more done. So just in 2023, you can look at the number of states that have now passed this into law. Uh, at the end of last year, um, one of the states that really plagued me was actually California. So Governor Newsom actually vetoed the biomarker coverage bill. So we then sent, went back to work. Education of patients is a big part of what we do at ACS, but educating legislators, legislators is another. So we educated Governor Newsom. It's now passed the House and Senate. I'm in California and I'm waiting for him to sign. I'm also waiting for the governor of New York to sign. And if they don't sign, they'll be hearing from me. So we have continued work to do here in Colorado toward biomarkers. And once we normally pass a certain number of states, the rest of the states go with it. But this is a way that we can truly affect change. It's data-driven based on some of the science that came here from Colorado about the importance of getting patients to therapy the first time. But then also the challenges of telling the story of patients who have access to biomarker testing. And so a really important uh, component of what we do, and that's an example at the state level. So Colorado efforts, we are uh, working right now. We have 40 plus volunteers that are uh, representing diff 20 different districts here in the state and 18 Senate districts that are advocating during our Cancer Action Day. The bill passed the House Health and Insurance Committee in February um, after testimony from ACS CAN, and you guys supported this bill. So I'm very thankful for that. Now, we are also um, uh, working with volunteers here in this state on some things, some of the things that we're working on at the federal level as well, which is Multi-Cancer Early Detection Screening Act, so that when multi-cancer early detection tests are FDA approved and shown to have clinical benefit, that there's a mechanism for patients to get access through reimbursement, as well as clearing the way for prostate cancer screening through the PSA Screening for Him Act. Again, this is an ask that we had in every House and Senate office last week. We also participated with you in Pride Month, understanding that the LG, LBGTQ plus community is disproportionately burdened from cancer and barriers to screening. So a really important component there for us. Uh, with regard to advocacy as well, we have working with you in the breast cancer space. Uh, we're working with the Colorado Women's Wellness Connection to provide free breast cancer screenings, for example, and have uh, devoted significant funding toward that end. We're also working within the state to up to increase your amount of breast and cervical cancer screening through legislative action, as well as funding of the early detection and treatment program. 
We work as well in multiple different ways. You've got a lot of problems with smoking here in Colorado. And so uh, one of the things that we uh, did in this last year was actually how to win against Juul, uh, that we're targeting adolescents with flavored tobacco. Uh, you might think a lot of things about vaping, and I'd be happy to engage in that conversation. I talk to the vaping community regularly because they want to get into a dialogue with us about it. Bottom line is in the United States, vaping does not eliminate smoking. In fact, people who start vaping as an adolescent generally tend to then smoke and vape. Uh, and so until the data change, our position doesn't change. And so we were actually one of the plaintiffs in a RICO case, if you can believe that, against Juul and prevailed. So we do quite a lot in advocacy. I just want to give one more example of a win that I think is really important for a state that has a rural community like this in Colorado, and it has to do with colorectal cancer. So we all know that there have been innovations in science that led to at-home colorectal cancer risk test testing in the form of FIT testing, Cologuard, et cetera. Except what happened until January of this year is that if you went home and you took that test or you lived in a rural area where you couldn't get a colonoscopy easily and you took that test and you screened positive, now your colonoscopy, which was the next thing that you needed to have, was not going to be reimbursed. Why? Because now it's not screening anymore. Now it's diagnostic. And that barrier was real. So people actually didn't go to colonoscopy. And so as much as I'm enthusiastic about the moonshot and support the moonshot, after many visits to federal offices, including the White House multiple times to say, how about some ground shots? How about some stuff we can do right now? How about you, President Biden, talk to CMS and propose a rule to eliminate this barrier to colonoscopy? So that actually happened last year. And in January, starting in January of this year, colonoscopy is now completely reimbursed after someone screens home uh, positive. So this is the way that we take the science that you're doing and move it forward into giving people access to care. It's not a small task. But our biggest task is actually patient support. This is my largest workforce. We're present in 5,000 communities across the country. And just this part of ACS touches about 55 million lives a year. So what is it? A big component is education, educating pa patients and caregivers. We have no vested interest in where anybody gets their cancer care other than that they get quality cancer care and they understand their treatment plans. So we have more than 50 million unique individuals download all of our cancer information this year, every year and use it. We also have a 24 seven chat line. This is literally in use every minute of every day um, for individuals getting more information of everything from, I have no idea what to do because I was just diagnosed with cancer to I need to get to cancer treatment and I don't have a ride. So we try to solve for those things that are on that list of the gaps of why it is there are cancer disparities. Lodging is one of them. We have 31 Hope Lodges around the country. Shortly, I'll be opening my 32nd. These are where we house cancer patients and families free of charge during care. Some patients stay more than 200 days. It's really important for them to be near a major cancer center and as a major barrier. I'm just giving you some examples of what these look like. They reflect the communities that they're in. These are a very large um, uh, a commitment from me to do this, and I'm committed to opening the next 10 Hope Lodges. Now, if you look at the geography, geography of where these Hope Lodges live, you probably aren't very satisfied. And I'm not very satisfied either. So why does a geography look like this of a Hope Lodge, especially when there are places like this in Colorado, where you have a large rural population that needs to travel long distances to come here for care? And I will tell you that the answer is the federated model of the American Cancer Society that for which it lived in its first 100 years. And so what got prioritized in this region by that entity of ACS is very different than clearly what happened in the East Coast. We do have one in the West Coast. It's in Honolulu. It's one of our most important hope lodges. If you have cancer on the Hawaiian Islands or in Guam, you have to come to Oahu for care. That's the only place specialists are. And so getting patients into Oahu for care is a really important component of what we do. We recognize that similar type of challenges exist across the country and we're committed to solving. We also transport patients. So just in this you know, year to date, and this was actually slides a couple of months old, a little more than 27,000 patients that we actually give rides back and forth to care. Again, not sexy, but if you can only go to the infusion center through three days a week instead of five, you're not going to have a good outcome. I don't care what biomarker testing you had and what trial you're on. That's just the end of the story. And when I was leading oncology for Jefferson Health, 16% of our patients on any given year missed cancer care because they had no ride.
So you can't, you cannot uh, uh, really overestimate how fundamental this is. This is something that people can do. Communities can do. You can do. People have a lot of satisfaction giving cancer patients rides. And so this is a great way to get involved with ACS. People want to hear from those that are involved in science. They want to hear from people who have had a cancer diagnosis or a cancer journey in their family. And it's a great way to give back, even if it's only twice a year. So something I'd really encourage people to want to get to. We also recognize caregivers are incredibly important. Pa data, back to data and our priorities. So patients who have a caregiver do better than those who don't. So we need to educate the caregivers. And we have a number of grants um, that are associated with that and learning mechanisms for caregivers to help them support the person that they're giving. I also, again, coming from oncology, uh, could not believe more in patient navigation. So we believe in it to the point that we fund it. So we're funding patient navigators, including right here in Colorado. You guys successfully competed for 20 of our patient navigator grant, one of our 20 patient navigator grants, trust me, I would do more if I could, um, of more than 250 submissions. So you guys did really well on that. And I'm very excited about what we're going to learn here on patient navigation and how that will imprint our future patient navigation programs. Some of you may have read earlier in this month, we are spearheading the effort to actually credential patient navigators because it's now going to be, at least the lay navigators are going to become a reimbursable component in the physician fee schedule, um, hopefully uh, starting in January. And so we'll be a major part of that process. So, you know, this is something really important to us. Us, you know, the, the patient navigators grant to you guys is about $300,000 to pay for your patient navigator, but we're also engaging in transportation and lodging, even though we don't have a Hope Lodge here. So just already this year, we provided a little more than a thousand nights for patients who are being treated here at this cancer center. So if you don't know these things, that's why I'm here, but it's also the case if you have, if you do know these things and you have an opinion, an idea, something that you think we can do to be even more impactful, that'd be great. Um, the short number of rides of 89 caught my eye of there's got to be more need for that here in Denver because I've got a lot of states that look like this and I know how important rides are. Maybe you guys have got that solved somewhere else, but if you don't, we should probably talk. So also prostate cancer efforts. So really excited about, uh, you know, what we're going to do with prostate cancer together. So the prostate cancer task force with the Colorado uh, cancer Co coalition has been put together and we have a lot more to do for outreach in this um, state, as you saw with the disproportionate mortality, and we're going to get back to prostate cancer. And we've already talked about a lot of these screening efforts. So so at the end of the day, this is for us kind of like what the value proposition looks like. The breakthroughs come from cancer discovery. We have to continue to fund that. But the way that we give access for people to actually get those cancer discoveries is through advocacy and patient support. So we're committed to continuing to do that. And so that's kind of the, the, the majority of what I was going to tell you. But I want to spend the last few minutes just telling you some things that I want you to know about some areas of priority for us. And Potential, potentially presented some opportunities to work together. So one is in prostate cancer, and this is not just because I am a prostate cancer researcher, but again, a very data-driven one. So I now find myself doing very different kinds of research than I did uh, when I ran a wet lab. And that has to do with working with our epidemiology team. So, so at the end of last year, uh, I, was, I was putting together a study with my team looking at disparities in the GU cancers and uncovered some things that I think are really interesting across all the GU cancers across the United States by really literally combing all the data from every zip code in the, in the US. But the prostate cancer data is borderline alarming, which is why we've put it together as a priority. So I know you guys know this, it's the number one diagnosed malignancy of men in this country. This year alone, it will be almost one third of all cancer diagnoses for men will be prostate cancer. We also know that the economic burden for those men is incredible. So when we look at the health economic state of just the impact on those individuals, it tallies up to more than $3.3 billion. So this is a lot, something we need to solve. But the other thing that we know about prostate cancer is that it's imminently curable. So long as you identify prostate cancer well, it's still in its early stage. And this is not the year 2000. 
We don't look at someone with a high PSA and say, yep, send everybody to radical prostatectomy. The science has evolved. We're much better at determining who actually needs active care and who would benefit from active surveillance. And so what we do know is we can cure localized prostate cancer, and we know that we can't cure metastatic prostate cancer. And so I want you to keep that in mind when you think about why it is that prostate cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death for men, which by the way, and I'm 53 years old, I've been saying since I was 20. So it's probably time for us to do something about that. It is also the case that we have an early detection mechanism and have had a you know, risk mechanism of looking at something as simple as a blood test that can be scaled and put out into rural communities. But the real call to action is this. This is forget about understanding which demographic of men are in which, which graphic. It just doesn't matter. The story is the same for all of them which is that there has been a 3% year over year increase in the rates of prostate cancer incidence. This is one of those that's going the wrong way. And even worse, a 5% year over year sustained increase in men being diagnosed with more advanced disease. And that's just what I told you we can't cure. So we clearly have a problem and there are a lot of reasons to unpack what that is. I'm happy to talk about that. And all the data for all the GU cancers is published here. It's in European neurology. And um, you know, if you want to talk about that, that's, I'd be happy to answer questions. But it's also the case if you're a black man in this country, you're probably feeling super dissatisfied because black men and white in the U.S. are screened at the same rate. It's a low rate. Only 33% pre-COVID of uh, eligible men are screened for prostate cancer. So everybody's screened at this abysmally poor rate. So take away screening from the factor. And Black men have a 70% increased incidence of prostate cancer and a two to four fold uh, fourfold higher risk of death from prostate cancer based on any other demographic. It's the high, it's the, it's the most wide disparity that occurs in all of oncology. So, okay. So we really probably need to do something about this. So what does it look like in Colorado? The, you know, these are your estimated cases and estimated deaths. And again, is something that based on your comparison on benchmark with rate to the U S you're not doing very well. in. so Colorado has got some work to do for prostate cancer. The other thing that we found when we looked at the demographic data, and this is just white men, is that there are real disparities in geography. So that when we look at states like Florida, where we would see hand in hand, a low incidence along with a low mortality, that starts to look okay. And then you start to look at states like California, where there's a relatively low incidence and a high mortality. What does that mean? Is that access to care? Is it, is it something different? We just don't know. Is it that people aren't being screened in those areas at the same level? We really don't know. But what we do know is that we can unpack this and figure it out. So the Western states are something we're worried about. If you look at Colorado, you see kind of a similar theme. So in, you know, I'm not saying there are answers here. What I'm saying is that this is the basis for ask the kinds of questions about why you have this disproportionate mortality in the state. So you guys have seen this before. So something for us to look at. So what are we doing overall with prostate cancer? I think that we can do more. We have 42 active grants totaling a little less than $40 million. You see a stark disparity compared to breast cancer. Um, so something. And we did earlier this year, what we call our impact initiative. It's improving mortality from prostate cancer together. Uh, we launched this at Howard University earlier in this year, working with a lot of other not-for-profit organizations, um, two members of Congress uh, and biopharma to try to determine what it is that we could do to keep to think differently because we can't just keep doing the same thing and expect a dif different result. So the, you know, the, we'll look at this every year, early onset colorectal cancer is another major issue for us of another cancer that's going the wrong way for which we are investing um, significant effort. I don't want you to think that prostate cancer is the only one. I just wanted to give you a flavor for how it is that we're making decisions about priorities. And then the last one that I want to talk about, which I'm guessing probably nobody here knows anything about, but I want you to know about, is a different initiative that I lifted up about two years ago uh, with the goal of leaving fewer good ideas on the laboratory floor. And it's an impact investment strategy called Bright Edge. And so what is this? You know, we've funded, as we talked about, a lot of research. We all know about 
uh, it is translation. And, and Bright Edge is meant to accelerate different parts of this. And so what is it? The idea is to take these great concepts that have made it to the point where it needs to be developed into, to a startup, or it needs that angel funding to get to a clinical trial in order to understand whether or not there's value there. We have a lot of interest in making sure that those that we have funded have their science move forward. Again, since 1991, we put $3.3 billion into cancer research. We don't want to see a great idea die on a laboratory floor because it couldn't get into clinical trial because people didn't know how to do it. So I set aside a little LLC tucked into the organization called Bright Edge. It's impact investment. What is it? We invest in startups and we invest in startup ideas. We can't give a lot of money. We're a charity, but the ACS name means a lot and gives an opportunity once it's gone through our science and our investment fund to get subsequent funding from venture capital. So I wanna give you an example of how this has looked. So a cancer problem to solve, it has to align with one of our problems is accelerating progress in immunotherapy to enhance cancer cures. We had funded an ACS um, postdoctoral fellow who was working on immunotherapy and glioblastoma. That PI wanted to put together a small startup company. It was called Immunitas. We funded in, funded Immunitas in 2021, uh, and it subsequently was able to generate a significant amount of subsequent venture funding and is now Immunitas Therapeutics in, and is moving along in its pipeline, these agents into clinical study, not endorsing the agent, not even saying it's gonna work. But it met the endpoint we wanted, which is the science is being tested into the clinic. And we thought it was promising enough for us to invest in. And so an example of something that we got into, but I don't want you to think it's all about therapeutics because we fund across the cancer continuum for research, but also for Bright Edge. Financial toxicity, we talked about that as a major issue. So right now, in, in any given year, out-of-pocket costs for cancer patients in this country is $5.6 billion. Cancer patients are 2.7 times more likely to file bankruptcy than same-aged uh, same individuals who've never had cancer. It's an issue. It's also an issue for cancer centers when people have fi financial toxicity. Now, part of how, how we're addressing this is funding those patient navigators so that patients can help find uh, ways to offset but we also want to want to invest in innovation. So we've invested now twice in a startup called TaylorMed. It's an end-to-end -end AI platform to help cancer programs as well as cancer patients identify ways to offset financial toxicity. It's now launched and in testing in a thousand different clinics across the country. And so far, the ROI has been pretty good for both the patient and the cancer center. So this is the kind of thing that we're really interested um, in. So if you think of this as the cancer continuum, you, obviously you're not going to be able to read all of this, but these are just just to illustrate, we are fund, we are investing in startup ideas across the entirety of the cancer continuum. So if you, you're one of these people, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're thinking about something that you really would like to have funded as part of your startup or your startup concept, um, you know, happy to talk. It's a is to take data that we, from, from science that we funded or that, that others have funded, but that coalesce with our goals and put that into action on behalf of patients in an advocacy and a patient support way. Um, and Bright Edge is, is one of our accelerants there. So uh, I just want to thank you, not just for listening to me today, but also for participating in what it is that you do. What you, what you do matters. It shapes our priorities. It shapes what happens here in the state and in the nation and in the understanding of science. So um, thank you very much. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Please. Thank you very much. One sec, so that Zoom can hear too. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot we have people online. Made a 
a robust investment in roundtables in order to convene people. I wanted to, to get your thoughts on the continuation of those into the future and what your vision is there. Yeah, so the way I've structured the American Cancer Society, there are two things I didn't talk about today that I probably should have. One is roundtables, the other are guidelines. So um, ACS's roundtables are really important for us and they live largely under my chief patient officer who heads the patient support pillar. So these roundtables are intended to bring key stakeholders together to create best practices or to, to, to work together as one and speak as one voice. Example, we run the nurse navigation roundtable. So it allows us to set best practices for what a navigator should and shouldn't do. And that, that buy-in from that group, as we think about credentialing of navigators is really important, or even how it is that we um, put together our navigation funding program. So the roundtables are incredible. We have roundtables on lung cancer. We launched one last year on breast cancer and one on cervical cancer. We have one on HPV and working with those groups groups has really helped us increase HPV vaccination uptake across the country. So the roundtables are also not a small investment for me. Continue that, intend to continue them. I'd like to actually to expand the roundtables. Um, I just have to make sure that they have a specific mission and a metric of success. Um, the other place we do roundtables is under the auspice of advocacy. So there's one called uh, OVAC. One Voice Against Cancer, also 50 plus organizations. And we really want to push hard legislatively. We sometimes use OVAC. Karen, thank you so much for coming, visiting with us and, and for doing what you do. This is a, a very important organization. I, I, you know, Personally, I don't think I've uh, started many uh, PowerPoint presentations where the first one or two slides is not from cancer statistics uh, in one form or the other. So my question to you is, you know, the, the, the Moonshot initiative has set lofty goals of decreasing mortality by 50% over the next 25 years. I think we're actually going to beat it um, looking at current trends. And you stated yourself last year there was a 2% decrease in mortality. And if you look over the last 10 years, that's actually accelerating over time. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so if we were not for COVID-19, I would say we were on a path, I hate to say this, President Biden, but even if we did nothing, we would probably, to dif different, we would probably hit that just if we kept on the same trajectory. But I am really worried about where COVID left us. You know, we know about the lack of screening and the, you know, the, the tens of millions of Americans that skipped screening during COVID. And that's only from in colonoscopy. So that's an indicator of what else happened. What I would say, because I've seen the, early data reports or what our cancer facts and figures report is going to look like in January, cancer incidence is going to go way down. And I'm very worried about what, how that message is going to be handled. We're already starting to pre-socialize with the news media because that's a bad thing, right? That's a, that's a people didn't go get screened. And so I am concerned about not just what's happening in prostate, but, but the potential for late stage diagnosis. And so that's what we're going to be keeping our eye on. Had it not been for that, I really do think that we would get there. And so I think it's going to be appropriate for us, especially for the screenable cancers, to start to shift emphasis on survivorship, quality of life, and early detection, and how we get more people into screening. But if we could, I always say, if I could wave a magic wand, I have every single person in this country, when they go to the doctor, it doesn't matter what the reason is, to say, what is the right screening plan for me? So that it just becomes a routine, regular thing. I, then I think we'd, we'd exceed the goal. I'd like to. Great question. Hi, Karen. That was a great talk. Um, so a couple questions for you. One's around the Bright Edge program, which I hadn't heard about before. That's really cool. And so you're going to, you have to have received an ACS grant before and doesn't know. No. So it no. can be anyone who wants to move their science sort of into the clinic or pharma or move it forward. Yep, exactly. And so the kinds of things that we'll look for is, you know, people you do not have to be funded by ACS, just have to have a great idea. Um, if you're, you know, it's especially great if you've gotten a small startup already put together to say, look, I'm about to go series A, here's my goal. And we'll look at the science first. If yes, then, and, and it has to, it has to improve life, right? It has to really like for our, our minds really have a very clear vision to why this thing, this product or service could improve life. And if yes, and it passes through the science community, then it's going to go to the investment community. And then they're going to start to ask things like, 
um, I'm on both. So they'll, they'll start to ask things like, uh, what is your, what is your leadership structure look like? And ask questions about your strategic plan. And so like those, those are the kinds of things that if someone's ready for, it's okay if you don't have all the right answers, as long as you, as long as it looks like you're on the right trajectory, it's a potential to make it. And then my second question was around your hope centers, which we talked about a little bit when we met today. And yeah, that graph or that that uh, schematic of the country was Spat, striking. Right? Yes, Spat. exactly. Even more so than I imagined when you told me about this. And I know that it's, you no longer have a federated model. So is your intent to then very specifically move and, and start some of these out West where they're completely absent? Yes. So, so let me talk, take a sec, uh, take a minute, just to talk about Hope Lodge for a second. So it's very different than kind of a, or would be very excited in addition to the obvious that the cancer patient gets closer to care. So all of them are set up in suites so that you have to have a caregiver stay with you because they don't have clinical um, staff present on the Hope Lodge. So patient and caregiver have a room, but where all the magic happens is in the other parts of the lodge, like the kitchen, like any family, people are down there in this large test kitchen every night after chemotherapy, radiation therapy, whatever, making dinner together and sharing ideas. There's a lot of mental relief that comes from being with like people. We also have special floors for patients on BMT or uh, going into cell-based therapy. So that's kind of nuts and bolts of the lodge. But what's happened in Hope Lodge too, point is beyond that. So working with the cancer center to say, Hey, would you guys like to run a behavioral study, a nutrition study, physical therapy study? Cause we've got a gym and what better place to do it in a controlled environment. And by the way, not just studies for the patients, but studies for the caregivers, they like this too. And it gives us also an opportunity to socialize them on what is a clinical trial. A lot of Hope Lodge patients are repeat, you know, they come the first time because they had surgery and then they come the second time because they have five weeks of radiation therapy. So to teach them early on about what is a clinical trial in partnership with the cancer center is really important. So we feel like these are vital components of, you know, near, near advanced cancer centers. So we are on our right now assessment of what are the next 10 going to be and where are they going to be? And they're not, they're not a small investment for me, right? Each Hope Lodge costs me about a million dollars to operate every year. So right now I'm committing to $32 million every year to operate the Hope Lodges, but I really believe in them and I want us to do more. So we know that um, the next three are likely to be San Antonio, where we're, we're going to break down soon. Um, Chicago and the potential for Seattle, but we are, we, I was checking with my chief patient officer before I came here, we are looking at Denver. And so we would come to administration to say like, how can we work together for this? Uh, you know, we would own it and operate it, but certainly not something that we would do without a strong buy-in from the cancer center to say, yes, we want this. But once I, I has anybody in this audience ever been in a Hope Lodge? One. Yeah, it's pretty much a game changer. And it's the case that once you've actually volunteered in a Hope Lodge, you'll never forget the experience. And so it's great for a community too, to see like what is actually the important, like we'll go, I do it, my staff does it, my chief information officer does it. We'll go and serve dinner at a Hope Lodge or if since I'm, I'm not very musical, but some people will play music in the Hope Lodge. And just the ability to interact with the cancer patients is just a, it's one of those things that make you feel good about the world. I think I've got the mic over here. That was fantastic, Karen. It, so informative at multiple levels. Um, so my question really relates to, you know, one of the things that ACS has, you know, invested enormously, which is junior investigators, you know, everything from postdocs through junior faculty. And I'm wondering, uh, how do you guys sort of promote their career development beyond just giving money? Yeah, I think that's an area of opportunity for us. And so as we query, so every year, the cancer center directors get a poll from me that asks how we're doing in certain areas. And also um, this year, I added a force rank uh, under discovery or what are the things that are the most important to you to see funded? And early career investigators was, I think, number two in this next year. We're going to roll out the data at the AACI meeting next week. So all the cancer center directors. But it's case that we know it's really important. And ACS, I think because of the federated model, didn't necessarily do a great job 
at creating a community of those that were funded and having them form a peer group and support each other throughout their careers. And that's certainly my vision. It's certainly Bill Dayhut, my chief science officer's vision. And we've just hired also from the NCI. They're going to get really mad at me if I keep hiring from there, but the head of extramural to, to work under him, Tina Annunciata. She's phenomenal. And that's her vision too. And so look for more to come, but I think we have work to do there. And that's exactly the kind of feedback that we want to get. Like where are our opportunities? And it's beyond just like funded and forget it is what I kept saying we were doing, which I didn't really love there, as you can imagine. So imagine this, this, this organization is operating as a hundred years as a federated model about data handling. So when you ask simple questions, as Haida and I were talking about this earlier today, like how many people did we fund in the last 10 years with lung cancer. And that's a requires hand curation and like, no kidding, going through boxes of bankers boxes, you know, like piece of paper. So 2021 moving forward, we're a data curious organization. Um, previous date, it was just not, it just wasn't done. Like there was no one ACS and that's what held it back. Hey, Karen. Yeah, mine is kind of a follow-up question um, from James's and this idea of, continuity. And we actually, I was uh, the PI on our ACS institutional research grant for quite a while. And I just handed it over to Tracy, Dr. Tracy Lyons. But a lot of our Cancer Center mentor members have had the ACS IRG grants and then gone on to get research scholar grants. But I really like this idea of having them hook up all, all of those at the different institutions that have IRG grants and meeting each other and then sort of having, maybe we should even do this here. We did some mentored um, mentoring to try to help them get the uh, research scholar grants, but I think a network of them around the country would be really nice. I, 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 I am very open to great ideas about how to create a community. I don't, I think having face to face right now is a great idea. You've got beautiful space. You're in the middle of the country. If you guys want to be the first one to host, you know, an ACS awardee conclave, I'm all about it. So, um, so let's talk. That sounds great. And then, you know, I also got the um, ACS Diversity and Cancer Research Award, and I think that that pipeline is a really great thing. And and as I was thinking about this, I thought, well, maybe we could sort of hook up the networking of the IRG and the research scholar grants back and, you know, really engage them with the, the undergrads that come for the diversity and cancer research in the summer. Yeah. That'd be great. Would love that. I didn't get a chance to talk about this. I'm going to talk a little bit about it tonight at the reception, but, um, we're very, very focused on the strategy of enhancing diversity in cancer research, but also developing strategies to accelerate women into leadership because we know it's also a big gap in, in, the, in cancer research and cancer care. And so our DICER diversity in cancer research grants are a big component of that. But we also have you know $20 million right now on HBCUs to give them ideas or to give them opportunities to conduct cancer research. <laughs> and we want those undergraduates to have an opportunity to see what is it like to be at a major medical school? What is it? And in multiple capacities, right? As a researcher, as a clinician, as an oncology social worker, what, whatever it is that they're really interested in, we're anxious to find ways to take not just the, what's happening at the HBCU, but also develop ties and pipelines to other organizations. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to explore. Great. Okay. I'll talk to you more later. All right. Uh, I think we have two questions um, and then we're going to have to cut off questions. My apologies. <laughs> That's good. That's cancer prevention at work. Uh, uh, great presentation. I have um, an interesting question that maybe will be of interest to the society also for the future years, and is the potential impact of long COVID in cancer. No necessarily incidents, because like you said, probably with non being diagnosed for several years, the incidents may go down, but in a moving and looking to the future, what will be the impact of long COVID, which is affecting a huge number of people right now worldwide? 
And primarily in the context of the inflammation, how inflammation can affect actually cancer yeah. progression. Great question. It's actually something that we are tracking in multiple ways. So actually, Ahmadine Jamal, who runs our Cancer Facts and Figures, is one of the most humble people in the world. Just had a really terrific paper released a couple of days ago. There's a big press release on it, looking at the impact of COVID on cancer mortality, uh, and and you know showed kind of proof positive, right, that that can that cancer um, deaths in, were enhanced in those that concurrently had. COVID. COVID, which is not surprising, but you know, still had to be validated by data. So long COVID is the next party and his team are looking at that. We also have cohort studies where we're following 306,000 healthy individuals over their lifetime. Um, we started enrolling them in the 90s and they're you know heavy into their cancer incidence years right now. And so we're tracking them in terms of COVID and potential for long COVID internally. I don't know if we're funding an extramural space on that yet, but I'll find out. It's a great question. And certainly COVID is going to be with us for a while. I guess I get the the last question. So a uh, very nice talk, of course. Um, so it, one of the numbers that you presented that I thought was kind of pathetic for Colorado was the the transportation number. Yeah. Um, so can you talk? I got a states bit that do that in one day. <laughs> yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that? Like, what does it mean? How do you get involved? How can we yeah. help? Like what's required? Are you, do you drive your own car? Like just details and yeah. how we could do that. So road to recovery is awesome. Um, it is easy and people can commit to a lot or commit to one day. It doesn't matter. We will take all the volunteers that we've got. So how does it work? You, do you have anybody from oncology social work in here? Usually, uh, your pa so the patient navigator, for example, that we're funding here at Colorado will be aware of the transportation programs. And so if somebody needs transportation, they can call us up and say, hey, we need a ride. But that's different than how you yourself volunteer. That's you contact us and you can, you can sign up at cancer.org uh, or you can contact me. It's called Road to Recovery. And what patients really, really like is the ability to be with somebody who actually understands something and what they've gone through, either because they're similar to their cancer survivor or they've had someone in their family, or if they're a cancer researcher, they love that too. And I promise you it will be the best part of your year. It's really awesome. I mean, I have NCAA basketball coaches that have fallen in love. We have a big thing with them called coaches versus cancer who once they, once they do it once, it's like, it's like an addiction. They can't stop. Right. And then they're, and they're enrolling other people and their players to go through and drive patients back and forth to therapy. But if you say I can only do it once a month, we'll take it. But it is a really great, great way to get involved. Yeah, you use your own car um, and you just get paid, somebody back and forth to care. Simple as that. And they'll love meeting you. They will be so enthusiastic about what it is that you do. So, and you'll give them hope, which is part of it. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Karen. Yep. You bet. Thank you, everybody.